I have the soul of the Apache uprising. But Victoria is still the heart. And Victoria is still free. And I want him. I want him dead! Before I have to look at another mutilated white man! Hey everybody, Johnny the Queer Potus here. And today we're going to be talking about Victorio's War, The Last Stand of the Apaches. Now, this is a story that a lot of people don't know the details of, don't know much about. It is also a very complicated story involving a lot of names and places and people that you may not have heard of. So I'm going to start with a general overview of what exactly happened, and then we'll dive into the details of this incredible moment in American history. So the time period we're dealing with is the late 1870s, so 1879 to 1880. The place is Apacheria, which is an area that comprises parts of New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and Mexico. And it is the ancestral homeland of the Apache people. Now, what exactly is going on? Well, the United States has just finished the Civil War. And at the end of the Civil War, many of the people who were fighting out east are seeking their fortune out west. So they start moving out into the western part of the country. There are many types of different migrants that move into the West. Their stories range from poor, unemployed immigrants seeking to escape filthy, destitute cities to capitalists aspiring to strike it rich, mining gold, copper, and whatever other resources might be available out there. Now, the U.S. Army is drawing down its forces. The one million man army is now getting close to 25,000 regulars, and it sort of leaves all of these new settlers who have arrived in the West to fend for themselves. Now, the Indians, who are kind of shocked by this influx of so many settlers from the East, are going to start to worry about their future and step up attacks against the settlers to sort of set down their sovereignty over the region. And it's going to create a conflict. While this is all going on back in Washington, Indian reform is taking place. The U.S. government is trying to reform its Indian policy. Uh, which is in the grips of a corrupt Indian Affairs Bureau under the Interior Department. President Ulysses Grant is going to institute a peace policy toward the Indians, which is ironic because it's going to result in the Indian Wars, which is a blanket term encompassing major clashes with myriad Indian nations, including the Lakota, the Plains Indians, the Nez Perce, and of course the Apache, on whom we're going to focus today in this video. Well, we're going to have to start by talking a little bit about who are the Apache and what is Apacheria? And the Apache are a collection of tribes and bands that populate a huge territory from the Colorado River to the mountains of the east side of the Rio Grande in New Mexico, and from the border with Mexico and 1,000 miles north to the canyons. It includes parts of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Sonora, and Chihuahua, that's in Mexico. There are around 6,000 Apache around the time of our story. Many of them had emigrated from Canada in around 1000 AD toward the south. As they were emigrating, they split into three distinct groups, the Western Apaches, who populate Arizona, the Mescaleros, who are in the southeast and closer to Texas, and uh, in between them are the Chiricahua, which is the group that Victorio belongs to. In fact, he belongs to a subdivision within the Chiricahua known as the Chihenes, and the Chihenes settle in the Warm Springs region of New Mexico. The band that Victorio belonged to, the Warm Springs Apache, believed that the land was given to them by Usan, who is the chief god of the Apache religion. Now, Apaches first make contact with Europeans through the Spanish, who arrive in the Mexico area at around 1550. They unfortunately bring a lot of different diseases with them. They also bring slave traders, and they are seeking gold as they go through Mexico. Many of these slave traders are going to be moving further north and enslaving people along the way. In 1542, King Carlos of Spain will ban Indian slavery, but the encomienda system will allow wealthy landowners to force Indians into labor for a tribute, which is kind of one step before slavery. The presence of slave traders and gold diggers in the region will have an effect on the Apache and it will turn them and many of the other Indians in the area into slave traders themselves. 
Uh, they will begin to engage in raids, especially as they're introduced to horses, which allow them to ride into areas and conduct these incredible raids. Now, with the introduction of horses, and as the Apache and other Indians become sort of more confident in their clashes with the Spanish, they're eventually able to rise up to a certain degree and extract some concessions from the Spanish. There are some agreements and treaties. And for a while, the Spanish and the Indians live together. They intermarry, they trade, they trade slaves, and they engage together and against each other in warfare. The Chihenes populated a much harsher area, a mountainous region, which was often viewed as sort of off limits by the Spanish. And so the Chihenes remained largely untouched by the cultural exchanges with the Spanish. And so they were able to maintain some kind of autonomy in the mountains. And being in the mountains, of course, puts them in a great position to be great warriors uh, in the future. Victoria's people, however, did catch on to the raid and trade economy, and they engaged in the trading of slaves and raiding of villages and towns. You get the stuff, you trade it with the Spanish, you make lots of money. It's a great economy. All was more or less well and good until the establishment of Mexico in 1821. The Mexican Revolution gives birth to a new country. However, there are a lot of problems and they're focused further south near Mexico City. And way up north, there is really not a lot of uh, jurisdiction. The Mexicans are not enforcing law and order in the region. And so American settlers see an opportunity to take advantage and they start moving into the region right after Mexico becomes an independent state. And this migration of American settlers into the region will coincide with Victoria's birth. Victoria was born in 1820, probably in Warm Springs. And if you'd like to see where that is on the map, you can just look at New Mexico here. It's in the south area here. I've got another map here. You can see that the Rio Grande forms the border of Texas and then if you see where El Paso is down on the bottom of the map, past El Paso, the river starts to go straight up north. And so right where the river crosses over the border with New Mexico is where the Warm Springs Chianes were located. You can see this map provides a little bit of a closer view, uh, the Rio Grande and then several creeks that jut out to the west. There's also the Mimbres Mountains, Cook's Range, and the Black Mountains, which is uh, going to be crucial for Victorio in his military exploits to be able to get up to higher ground. So this is the area that he is raised in, where the Warm Springs are located, which uh, he and all Chianes believe were gifted to them by Usan, the god. Victorio will be taught from a very young age, as all Chianes are, in the spiritual traditions of the Apache people, and he will be trained as an Apache warrior from a very young age. This training will include learning how to pass through areas unseen and unheard, how to cover your tracks so nobody knows that you were camping somewhere, how to raid, how to use the high ground for an attack. In fact, one of the earliest trainings that Victorio experiences as a young boy is he's told to run up a mountain as fast as he can. And running up mountains will be a huge part of his training, and he'll be progressively asked to run up steeper and steeper mountains to form strong leg muscles and to understand the art of high ground warfare, which we will talk about during the war. Victorio lives most of his life in obscurity as far as the American press and history is concerned. It will be the events of 1879 through 1880, his 13-month war with the Americans, that will ensure his legendary status in American history. Now, although whites were already entering Apacheria at the time of the establishment of Mexico, it was really not until the end of the Mexican-American War that migration started to come in in earnest. And that took place in 1848. The settlement between the Mexican and United States governments cuts Apacheria in half. Let's actually take a look. You can see on this map, we've got Texas, we've got New Mexico and Arizona, and we have a border now between Mexico and the United States. This border did not exist before. That was all Mexico. Well, now this land belongs to the United States, and a lot of settlers are interested in coming in and settling it. Well, the whites start to come in in increasing numbers. And at first, the relationship between the Apaches and the Americans is rather balanced. Uh, they have a pretty good economy going. The Apache, including the Chihenes, 
will go on raids in Mexico and in parts of New Mexico and attack villages and take stuff and bring it to the Americans and trade it for guns. So we have Americans coming into the region with guns and they are trading it with these people who are going to come back with those guns and fight against them. Hmm, That sounds like a very familiar story in American history, doesn't it? Well, after a while, the government in Sonora, which is just south of Arizona there, you can see it on the map, gets a little annoyed with all of these Apache raids and they pass a law to pay bounty hunters for Apache scalps. Now, you've probably heard of scalping before, and you're probably used to hearing of scalping as an Indian practice, but the Apache did not practice scalping. In fact, they believed that it was very bad luck and very bad spiritual luck to desecrate the body of somebody who has already died. And so they very, very rarely engaged in scalping. However, the Sonorans and then later the whites who moved in the territory will actually pick up on scalping because of the practice of putting out bounties for Apache scalps. So we have this interesting reversal here where we normally think of scalping as an Indian behavior, but here it's actually the Europeans who are engaging in it. Who was it started the practice of paying bounties for Indian scalps? So this is the tenuous balance of power that exists between the Apache, the Mexicans, and the Americans at the time. The Mexicans are attacking Apache and scalping them. The Apache are attacking the Mexicans and taking their stuff and trading it with the Americans in exchange for guns. And this is the balance of power that exists between the United States and the Apache when the Civil War breaks out. It breaks out in 1861 and it causes a massive evacuation of white settlers from the region, many of them going back east as quickly as possible to join the Union Army and fight against the rebellion or to join the rebellion and fight against the Union Army. And with so many whites out of the region, the Chihene see an opportunity to reassert control. And it's at this time that a very influential Chiricahua chief named Magnus Coloradus is going to emerge as one of the great warriors of the Civil War period. And he's going to be an important influence and trainer for Victorio. Still, the United States and the Confederacy are going to be looking at this region of the world and wondering who controls it. Well, the Confederates are going to make the first move on January 18th, 1862, when their Congress declares Arizona a territory of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis sends Henry H. Sibley and 2,500 Texans west to capture New Mexico and continue to march to the gold fields of California. So they're going for all the marbles here. They march up the Rio Grande and move north until they get to Henrietta Pass, where New Mexico and Colorado volunteers are waiting for them, and Sibley's troops are forced to evacuate. Although the Union is able to assert control at this point, Southern sympathy in the region is rampant, and there is a constant sense of who really owns or controls this territory. There's an interesting movie called The Last Outpost. It actually stars Ronald Reagan, where he plays a Confederate soldier. And in the movie, he disguises himself as a Union soldier to sneak into a Union camp and try to coordinate an alliance between the Union and the Confederates so that they could fight together against the Apache. And the theme of the movie is sort of, you know, why are white men fighting each other when they could be together fighting against the savagery of the Apache or whatever? warlike Indians were in their way. They're only happy when they're fighting. Well, let them enjoy themselves against the enemy. Their enemy is the whole white race, Mr. Delacourt. Now, this sudden influx of soldiers that resulted from the conflict between the North and the South in the region sort of put the Apache on high alert. And so they started to form up and train. And some of these folks like Magnus Coloradus and Geronimo and Victoria and Koshice, they all start meeting together and getting ready to face off against what they expect to be a huge influx of whites. Well, that influx comes from a direction that they don't expect. The War Department orders James H. Carrollton and 2,300 volunteers to march from California into Arizona and on to New Mexico. One of Carrollton's units under Captain Thomas L. Roberts, with 126 troops and two howitzers, is going to set off from Tucson across Chiricahua territory. 
Victorio and the other troops are going to position themselves at all the major water sources to try to prevent the American troops from drinking so that they get very tired and weary. And when they're at their worst, they can attack. On one occasion, when the U.S. troops approach one of the major springs in the area, Victorio and his warriors are waiting for them, and they engage in one of the largest battles between Apache and U.S. troops in American history. It will ultimately be a Pyrrhic victory for the U.S. troops as they will lose a lot of soldiers to the Apache, but they will win the day and the Apache will have to leave the field. This event is significant in Victorio's life for two reasons. Number one, is it's the first time he encounters howitzers. So it's the first time he's encountering heavy artillery. Fire! The other reason this is significant is that it's the first time in Victoria's life that he sees white people coming in from the West as opposed to the East. So now Victoria is feeling like the Apache are kind of getting squeezed in from both sides and it's going to significantly affect how he views the future of coexistence between Apache and whites. During the civil war, Magnus Coloradus, who's kind of the leader, the one everybody looks up to, eventually decides to negotiate with the whites. And while he's with them, they arrest him. He's tortured, he's scalped, his body is desecrated, which deeply offends the religious sensibilities of the Apache. And so this will leave a terrible taste, obviously, in the mouth of the Apache. But it will also provide an opening for Victorio. As Magnus Coloradus is now gone, people are looking to him for leadership. And he's going to need to be there for his people because they are about to experience a whole new set of circumstances that up to this point the Apache have not yet experienced. Around the same time that the Apache are having their early clashes with American troops, there is a major revolt going on in Minnesota. The Sioux or the Dakota are rising up and fighting in violent fashion against the Americans. At the end, when all is said and done, 38 Dakota warriors will be hanged for their crimes. And this really brings the question of Indian affairs up to the Lincoln administration. Lincoln's commissioner of Indian affairs is a man named William P. Dole, and he will have an interesting idea about how to deal with Indians in the future to prevent these kinds of revolts and to maintain peace on the frontier. This is from the New York Times, 1862. Commissioner Dole's report on Indian affairs is very long and presents the subject in all its aspects. He opens the document by recommending the plan of placing all the Indians upon reservations, teaching them civilization, and when developed sufficiently, dividing up the lands among them. Then they will sometime be so far advanced as to have interests identical with those of the citizens of the various states. What we're witnessing right now is the very early stages of what we're going to call Indian reform. And Indian reform is going to play a huge role in this story. We'll talk about it in just a moment. Now, to understand Indian reform, we have to go to the end of the Civil War. During the Civil War, people are not moving west in such large numbers. But once the war is over, there is this huge migration out into the west. The U.S. government is rather tied up with Reconstruction. And so Indian Affairs is just sort of left to the Interior Department, which is incredibly corrupt and allows all of these civilian agents to go around in these territories and do basically whatever they want. A lot of them are just there to make money off of the suffering of the Indians. Now, the other side of the coin is that with all of these settlers moving into the West, but the United States military drawing down at the end of the war, there's not a lot of military protection for the settlers against attacks from for example, the Apache. Major, what about them Redskins, Major? Are you going to fix it so they'll leave us alone? You're going to make a deal with them? Yeah, what about it? We got a right to know what the Army's going to do. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Delacorte, special emissary from Washington. He has come to settle the Indian question once and for all. Gentlemen, how do you plan to settle it? With more talk or more soldiers? Yeah. In 1869, Ulysses S. Grant is elected president of the United States, and he decides to institute a peace policy which he will refer to as a kind of new deal for the red man. The grant peace policy is meant to protect Indians by designating special land for them that settlers could not settle. Now that's interesting because if you think about it, we're talking about reservations, which have kind of a bad connotation to them. They are associated with removal and with genocide. But in 1869, President Grant is actually offering reservation 
as a means to protect the Indians from the attacks of the settlers. He's also calling to improve the conditions of the Indian people, to make them citizens, to bring them into American civilization. Now, Grant was specifically against the old system of bribery and these unenforceable treaties that Indian agents concluded. These treaties were often contradictory. They usually involved some sort of tribute or reward for the civilian agent himself who enriched himself off of these treaties. And so Grant is looking to institute a much more streamlined law and order system in the West. And he believes that only the U.S. military actually has the power to implement fair relations with the Indians, uh, that the civilian agencies are just corruption and that the United States military has to go directly in. Now, it may be weird to think about a peace policy that is instituted by a military, but think about it from the perspective of Grant, who had led the Union Army in the Civil War, an army that could credibly claim they had liberated millions of enslaved people in the East. And so here they are now talking about liberating and bringing into civilization the Indian people, just like they did with the formerly enslaved people. So you can kind of understand the mentality that they're coming from. At the same time, relying on the army to institute a peace policy means that there isn't going to be any quarter, any room for any resistance against what the United States is doing. And all resistance will be viewed as something that needs to be suppressed, something that needs to be shot down and destroyed. And so the peace policy is going to lead us into the Indian Wars. Now, believe it or not, Victorio is not necessarily against the idea of the reservation system at first. Uh, at a certain point, the reservation makes sense as a protection from what could only be understood as an unstoppable flood of settlers. But as Grant's policy starts to take effect, his belief in the reservation system is going to gradually wane. And he's going to start to see it as the beginning of the end for the Apache way of life. In fact, his biggest complaint is that the peace policy is relegating the Apache people to a life of dependency on government rations, which were often in short supply. And you can see here in this picture, we've got a whole group of Apache people sitting outside of a ration station in Arizona, waiting for those few pieces of bread and a and water, whatever they had to offer there, which was not much. So these people are living off the drip drip that's coming from the federal government, and they have lost their traditional way of making a living. So they're stuck in this web of dependency, which Victorio absolutely cannot accept. And this will fuel his resistance against the American efforts to put Indian people on reservations, disarm them, and force them to live off of the government dole. At the same time, many people in New Mexico and Arizona are not happy with the peace policy. They want to see a heavier hand against the Indians, especially those Indians who don't follow the treaties, who don't live on the reservations, people like Victoria. With Apaches and rebels all around and not enough soldiers, why well, you can't blame people for worrying if it's safe to sleep nights. So over the course of the 1870s, there's going to be this kind of slow march toward what will eventually be Victorio's War. And it's all going to begin on November 11th, when the Indian office proceeds with a plan to remove the Chihene people to Tularosa Valley. This is going to be the Chihene Reservation. Now, Victorio was not consulted at all, and so this is going to be the first problem. He initially refuses to go, saying that the site is very unhealthy. Of course, by Victoria's standards, nothing is going to compare to Warm Springs, but he is going to be flexible at different times during this period. Things are going to be even more complicated for Victoria when his second wife is killed by a roving band of white hunters in 1872. So some out of control settlers that come across this group of Apache and just wreak havoc. And this is actually a common theme in a lot of the movies that we see depicting this period of history, even movies that are white centered or racist by today's standards, usually they end up depicting the sort of drunken, out of control white settler as the worst of all the characters in the entire movie. Send them back where they belong. Don't listen to no squaw man. I am here under a flag of truce. 
We will speak further when you have silenced the foul mouthed scum responsible for. And it's largely due to incidents like this, which many whites in the region are disgusted by. But it's especially going to leave an impact on Victorio, who's going to put that in the file along with all the rest of the things he's experienced in life that tell him that coexistence with white people is not going to be possible. However, over time, he's going to be worn down as more white settlers move into the region, which is sort of narrowing the geography in terms of what the Apache can use, where they can go. And so finally, he will agree to go to Tularosa. And he will begin negotiations with an American general who will be sent over there, General O.O. O. Howard. General Howard, a one-armed man who lost his arm, I believe, at the Battle of Chickamauga. Check me in the comments if that's not true. He is a dedicated abolitionist, a leader of the Freedmen's Bureau, and he's most famous because Howard University, the first black college built to educate newly freed slaves, bears his name. And in fact, our current Vice President Kamala Harris is a graduate from Howard University. But Howard has this second career after the Civil War that a lot of people don't know about, uh, where he's basically implementing Washington's removal policies. When Howard comes to Tularosa in 1872, he meets with Victorio, and Victorio leaves the meeting feeling like this is a guy he can work with, and with a mistaken understanding that Howard agreed to allow the Chihene people to go back to Warm Springs. However, it turns out there was a misunderstanding of some sort, and so once again, Victorio is disappointed in the flimsiness of white men's promises. As conditions continue to worsen at Tularosa, including disease, hunger, and even raids from competing Indian groups, such as the Comanche, and keeping in mind that reservation Indians have been disarmed, and so they're particularly vulnerable to these kinds of attacks, the situation eventually becomes untenable, and on April 9th, 1874, President Grant signs an executive order which allows the Chihene people to return to Warm Springs. But of course, this will be a temporary return. While the Chihenes are celebrating the fact that they can go back to Warm Springs, a decision has already been made in Washington which is going to fundamentally alter their course for the worse. A site in eastern Arizona known as San Carlos has been chosen by the Indian office as the official reservation for the remaining non-reservation Apache in the area. That will include many Chiricahua bands. It will also include the Chihene. San Carlos Reservation is going to be notorious for the Apache as it's going to be one of the worst pieces of land that the government is going to try to settle them on. In fact, an American lieutenant named Britton Davis calls San Carlos Reservation Hell's 40 Acres, a reference to the government's program of distributing 40 acres of land to newly freed slaves. He's going to call this Hell's 40 Acres. The book that I used for this episode has a really good description of San Carlos Reservation. Soldiers assigned to San Carlos considered it the worst place in the whole territory. Everybody claimed that if people had ever lived there on a permanent basis, no Apache knew of it. The area was denuded of all vegetation, except for a few low-growing, viciously armored cacti. Temperatures soared to 120 degrees in the summer and hovered over 100 degrees from May through October. Water was stagnant and brackish, and in most places, there was none at all. Rocks heated to such intensity that their touch burned through moccasin soles. Rattlesnakes, tarantulas, scorpions, gila monsters, and giant centipedes infested what little shade was available, and at night slithered forth, making even more danger for humans. Needless to say, Victorio is not interested in moving to San Carlos at all. He's going to resist for as long as he possibly can. But by the summer of 1878, the government orders all of the Warm Spring Apache to San Carlos. Tell them they're not talking to me, but the United States government. No hablando él, sino al gobierno americano. Tell them that government orders them to return to their reservation. El gobierno lo ordena que regrese a su reservación. And tell them if they have not started by dawn, we will attack. Y le da de tell them that. Alba, si no atacará. In October of 1878, the Chihene people are escorted by 35 scouts from the 9th Cavalry to San Carlos. Victorio himself was at Fort Wingate, which is further north, so he decided to ride south to the Mescalero Reservation, where he hoped to recruit people for a resistance army to fight against the settlement of his people at San Carlos. Victorio spends a few weeks at the Mescalero Reservation and manages to gather a sizable group of people, including many Chihenes, to march back to Warm Springs, set up camp, and then go on raids in Mexico 
to supply themselves and feed themselves. Victoria and his allies go on their first raid into Mexico, and when they return, they find that U.S. soldiers have found their camp and have attacked viciously their camp, killing many of Victoria's friends and even some of his family members. Victoria's mother-in-law is actually killed during the attack. Within Victoria's group was a very interesting historical figure, a woman named Lozen, who was apparently Victoria's sister. Uh, she was also very steeped in the traditions of war. In most other eras of Apache life, she may not have been a warrior, but because of the desperate situation facing the Apaches and the fact that so few men with warrior skills were available, Lozen kind of steps up along with many other Apache women and starts to take a more active role. She leads troops into battle. She fires bows and arrows and guns, and she becomes a very formidable force within Victorio's army. Victorio's unwillingness to submit to the settlement of his people at San Carlos is going to eventually lead to the outbreak of hostilities. The fact that Victorio is moving around the area, that he is raiding people with impunity, and his raids are going to be stepped up more and more, and he's going to begin attacking American settlers as well. This is going to bring his movement very much to the center of attention for the United States military in the area. And Victorio is going to be moving about 300 people through the mountainous terrain while fighting off the Texas Rangers, the U.S. Buffalo Soldiers, American Soldiers, posses, and local militias, which are going to be hitting him from all different directions. And so Victorio's main strategy is going to be to keep to the mountains, try to draw forces up to places where the Apache can take higher ground, and then fire down at them and force them to flee. If they lose the battle, the Apache are also very knowledgeable in how to escape without leaving tracks so they can leave under the cover of night and the soldiers who had just fought them off are wondering where did they go and so victoria will live to fight another day while sustaining damage against his enemy and striking fear in the heart of his enemy in september of 1879 victoria's war begins in earnest the ninth cavalry buffalo soldiers are sent into the black mountains for two weeks to search for victoria they follow Victorio into the Black Mountains until they come to a place called Las Animas Creek. It's a place where there's some water and places to drink. Well, Victorio knows this, and so he's positioned himself and his warriors up on the higher ground. And when the Buffalo soldiers arrive, boom, they take action and start to fire. The Victorio book actually has a great description of this event, and it kind of highlights what exactly was this higher ground warfare that the Apache engaged in. On September 18th, one of Victorio's raiding parties hit the isolated McEvers Ranch, situated a few miles from the tiny village of Hillsboro. Another company of 9th Cavalry, under Captain Byron Dawson, picked up his trail. The Apaches, burdened with livestock, were moving slowly. Dawson saw his chance. He sent his soldiers along with 46 Navajo scouts after Victorio's warriors. They divided into the Mimbrus Range and founded a desolate spot where the Animus River originates in a steep canyon. It was not only a well-protected place, but allowed the Chihanes to cover most of the available shelter as well. In fact, with Dawson pinned down, a civilian militia from Hillsborough rode out to help the embattled troops. Victorio, who by now had joined his warriors, told them to set a trap. He asked Kaitene to make the trail so obvious that even white men might follow. In turn, Kaitene ordered the raiders to butcher a few of the McEvers' cattle and litter the trail with blood and entrails. Sure enough, soldiers and civilians followed. Suddenly, Dawson found himself at the bottom of a rocky defile, deluged with Apache gunfire and pinned down. During this battle, there was a private named A. Friedland who had advanced on the Apache, was shot, and was sort of stuck in the middle of the battlefield, wounded. This fellow right here in the picture you see, Sergeant John Denny, he was a Buffalo soldier, actually crawled out over 400 yards of open fire to grab Private Friedland and drag him back to safety. For his actions at Las Animas Canyon, Sergeant John Denny received the Congressional Medal of Honor 15 years later. And he's actually buried at the Soldiers' Home Cemetery in Washington, D.C. 
The 9th Cavalry Regiment is a unit of Buffalo Soldiers. And if you don't know much about the Buffalo Soldiers, this might be a good time for me to tell you a little bit about them. So after the Civil War, the military budget is slashed. The soldiers are going home. We're drawing down. But they also decide to create a few regiments of black troops. Over 200,000 black troops had served in the Civil War. And so many in the Republican Party are trying to continue the tradition of black soldiering. And many black soldiers who look up to those black soldiers who fought for the liberation of the slaves are seeing a chance for their own glory in the United States military. But rather than emancipating slaves, they're going to be sent west to subjugate Indians. And so this is going to create a kind of conflict for these people who are oppressed on one hand by the whites back home, but are doing the dirty work of the whites to oppress the Indians in the West. I'm a first sergeant in the United States Army. Army? Army bears you no love? None of you. They endure you. They'll endure you till they've wiped all the tribes from the slate with our blood. So in addition to Buffalo soldiers being sent out west to subjugate Indians, we also have the Indians themselves being co-opted by the United States military to subjugate the Apache. The best example of this is going to be the Apache police force. And you can see here an Indian agent by the name of John Philip Clum. He's a white man who moved out to the West and served as an Indian agent in the Apache region. He believes very strongly in the civilizing mission of Indian reform. He wants to help Indian people become farmers. He wants to help them become citizens of the United States to graduate them into the American system. And part of that includes actually having the Apache themselves police their own regions. We hear a lot about police reform, right? We want our community to be policed by our people, but we don't often think about the roots of that, which we can find here in this dark period of concentration of Indians. And so John Philip Clum creates an Apache police force, and he actually gets Congress to appropriate $30,000 to create 40 different police forces on 40 different reservations around the entire country. And it also establishes a tribal court system by which the Indians can dispense justice themselves rather than have the U.S. military do it. But he had a combative relationship with the U.S. military. A lot of them saw him as a do-gooder. They wanted more heavy-handed action taken against the Apache, and they didn't like people like Clum, who talked about working with the Apache to try to coexist in some way. What we want is action, not promises. Take them engines in the jailhouse. We're all for lining them up against a wall and shooting them. But the army says no. So Clum eventually loses his influence in Washington and he resigns. But the legacy of Apache police forces, Apache scouts, is going to continue. And the Buffalo soldiers are going to rely heavily on Indian scouts to help them communicate with people and to understand the landscape that they are conducting warfare in. Victorio's rebellion continued to create widespread panic throughout the United States. Calls from the settlers to capture and kill Victorio at all costs abounded. And we can further get a sense of this frustration that the Americans are feeling uh, from these New York Times articles written about the events that were taking place. It was from this reservation that Victorio, with 43 men and two boys, went out on the warpath last summer, since which time he has never ceased murdering and plundering in spite of the fact that according to reports inspired or sent from the military sources, there has been hardly a week during which the soldiers have not either whipped him or completely surrounded him or got him just where they wanted him. In other words, the military was constantly (laughs) playing up how hot on the trail of Victorio they were, when in reality, Victorio was constantly winning and it was creating a frustration in the East. When are they going to get this guy, right? And... I hate to make this comparison, but you remember feeling frustrated for so many years. When are they going to capture Osama bin Laden? When are they going to capture bin Laden? Oh, we almost got him. He was in that cave, but he got away at the last minute. See, are we that different than the people of this time period? I don't know. Seeking a respite in October of 1879, Victorio decides to split his forces and head into Mexico for the first time during the war. And he's in the Chihuahua region, which is close to the border of Texas, and that creates a kind of panic 
within Texas. And so the Texas Rangers march into Mexico after these Apaches. Keep in mind that the idea of sort of sovereignty and borders is a really loose concept at this time. So it's less of a gotcha than you think to say, ha, look, the United States invaded Mexico. It's not exactly like that. So don't think in those terms. We don't have Wilsonian nationhood ideas quite yet. So now that the Texas Rangers are hot on Victorio's trail, Victorio has to have a strategy to kind of wear down the Texas Ranger forces so that they're not at full capacity when they do eventually clash with the Apache. And he's going to employ a strategy of placing warriors on high ground points at every major watering hole and spring in Mexico so that when the Texas Rangers try to approach and take a drink, they are attacked by Apache and they have to move away. Over time, marching around in the Sierra Madres in the desert, they're going to get very tired and ill. Many people are going to die along the way. Some Texas Rangers are going to say, screw this, I've had enough and desert. And hopefully they will be in an incredibly weakened state by the time that Victorio actually clashes with them. At the same time, Victorio is not exactly in the most advantageous position himself. He's got a lot of things working against him too. For one, he's not very popular in Mexico. Remember that the Apaches' raid and trade economy depended heavily on raiding Mexican towns. And so there was a lot of hatred for Victorio, and he couldn't find a lot of shelter in the Mexican towns. There's a great story about a town called Carizal, which Victorio thought about going into and trying to get some supplies and things. But he was very suspicious of the people of Carizal that they were against the Apache. And this story sounds like something that came right out of the Old Testament. Victorio sends a scout by the name of Sanchez into Carizal to test the waters, to see what the feeling is in that village about the Apache. Now, Sanchez was part Mexican, perhaps completely Mexican. Either way, he passed for a Mexican. And so what he does is he goes to the outskirts of town and he finds a lonely vaquero, which is a Mexican cowboy. He kills him, takes his clothes, and sneaks into the village and just talks to the people. Oh, I heard the Apaches are coming. What do you think? And all the Carizales are going, oh, the Apache are coming. This is our chance. We can capture them. We can take their scalps and get a huge bounty. So Sanchez returns to Victoria and says, it's not looking good. Well, the next morning, Victorio gets an invitation from the Carizales to come down to Carizal and participate in a fiesta. Now, Victorio already knows that the Carizales want to kill the Apache. And so he agrees to come to the fiesta but the night before the fiesta, he sends a bunch of Apache warriors down to Carizal and has them run off all of the horses in town. So they just go to the big parking lot of horses. They let them loose and they have them run off into the desert. This causes all of the male gun owning <laughs> residents of Carizal to come out of their homes. And the Apache are already positioned waiting for them. And they just pick them off one by one. And they manage to kill somewhere around 40 men in this town. It's incidents like this that are constantly reminding Victorio that Mexico is a temporary measure. And if he's going to not starve and die, he's going to need to get back to the United States where he knows the territory better and where he has more friends. So if Victorio is outnumbered and if the U.S. is relentlessly pursuing this land, what is Victoria's strategy here? Is he just going out on a last stand? Is this suicide by cop? Or does Victoria actually have a plan to win something as a result of this war? Well, throughout the entire period that Victoria is conducting these raids and attacks on American troops, he is also making overtures to the United States to make peace on some terms mainly the terms of not having to live at the San Carlos Reservation. And there are a lot of people who are on his side. There's Colonel Hatch, who commands one of the Buffalo Soldiers regiments, who is trying desperately to work out a settlement by which Victorio can surrender peacefully and get some sort of concessions for his efforts. Hatch is going to be fighting a losing battle because as Victorio's war continues and as the violence gets worse and worse, people are going to be calling for Victorio's head. And so his position to negotiate for peace is going to be significantly hampered throughout the war. Victorio is going to make one last attempt to come back into the United States 
but he's going to have to cross miles and miles of desert. And unless he stops for a drink at some point along the way, these people are going to dehydrate in the desert and starve before they even get anywhere close to where they need to go. The United States military by this point has finally understood Victorio's strategy of blocking these springs and other places where troops can drink so that the U.S. military can't get any water and so they're tired. But it also helps him to control the direction of the military because if they can't go to this spring, if they can't go to that spring, well, we know they're going to go to that spring. So let's meet them there, get the high ground. When they arrive, we can fire at them. Well, now the situation is kind of reversed. The U.S. military has the advantage. There are soldiers blocking the border all along Mexico. And so there's really nowhere for Victorio to enter peacefully. And the U.S. military is now taking out maps and trying to find out where are all the water sources and springs so that we can block them and prevent Victorio from getting a drink of water or perhaps lure Victorio in to a spring and we can kind of turn his own strategy against him. Well, as they're searching the maps for these different springs, they find one called Rattlesnake Springs. And it's about 65 miles from Company H of the 10th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers. And so they send these Buffalo Soldiers on the ride of their life. They ride 65 miles through hot desert in one day to try to beat Victorio to the spring, and they manage to beat him. So when Victorio arrives at the spring, he sees that the Buffalo Soldiers are already well positioned. They exchange fire and there's this big battle. Victorio decides to turn back around and go back to Mexico. Now, a lot of people were mad at the Buffalo soldiers for allowing Victorio to escape. But what was Victorio escaping to? It was just delaying the inevitable as Victorio's forces sort of draw down and his dehydrated people are starting to get a little sick of all of this. Well, seeing the writing on the wall, Victorio decides to send all of the women and children back to the United States, and he has Lozen, his sister, lead them there. Now, Lozen, as she's crossing the border, is already seeing how U.S. forces are coming in, including Buffalo soldiers and Texas Rangers, to track down Victorio's forces. We know that on September 15th, 1880, a force under George Buell had crossed the border and moved in the direction of the Apache. So... We expect Lozen probably made that journey in mid-September. At the same time, a Mexican general by the name of Teresas decides to take on the task of capturing Victorio. He goes village to village and recruits Indians, Mexicans, creates a kind of impromptu army, and he decides to go after Victorio. Now, once again, Victorio needs to take a drink of water. And so he decides to move to a place called Tres Castillos. It's a big lake. There's lots of great drinking water. And that is where they're going to go. Teresas managed to figure out that that was likely going to be Victorio's destination. And so he takes units, now about 100 strong. He tells the Buffalo soldiers, your services are no longer needed. And they head back to the United States. And off they go to Tres Castillos. And when they arrive at Tres Castillos, they set up a line. And in the morning, they attack the Apache. And this one will be known in history as the Massacre at Tres Castillos. 78 Apache will be killed, and Teresas will only lose three men. Among those who are going to be killed at Tres Castillos is the warrior chief himself, Victorio. And here's an article from the New York Times, October 1880. There seems to be no room for further doubt as to the death of Chief Victorio. Though the leader of the Rio Membres Apaches has been too often slain in dispatches to make any mere report of his taking off at all credible. So still a lot of doubt and fear about Victorio even after his death. The Apache were eventually rounded up and put on these different reservations uh, and that turned out to be a kind of an irreversible thing. I'd like to go more into detail on that subject, but I do feel like we're approaching the end of the video. Uh, I've been talking for a while, and I think that if you're interested in the story, you should not restrict yourself to just watching this video. Let this be your first taste of the story. Go out and research more and learn more about the subject. I have provided in the description below a bunch of resources that you can use to learn more about Victorio, about the Buffalo Soldiers about U.S. Indian reform policy during the Grant administration and all the interesting stuff I've talked about in this video. So I want to thank you all for coming in today to learn about Victorio and his war against the United States, how the Buffalo Soldiers got involved as well. It's been a lot of fun researching this, and I hope that you learned something 
that you didn't know before you watched this video. So thanks everybody. And we'll be back in a few weeks or so with another amazing topic. So stay tuned to the Queer POTUS channel and have a great, fantastic day.